go for it. Okay, I'll do it. Hi, and welcome everyone to the Garden Hour with MU Extension. I'm sorry. My phone was ringing. I apologize for that. So we'll start over again. So welcome everybody to the Garden Hour with MU Extension. We're really happy to have you here. As I always say, we have a vast amount of knowledge of, with all of us combined, and hopefully we can answer all kinds of questions for you. We love to share the knowledge that we have and see people light up with learning. And that's why we do what we do with MU Extension. What I'd like to um, do today is let you know that um, unfortunately, Pat Ganan is not with us today for the weather report. Uh, he does have to take some vacation time away. And so we entitle him to that. So he um, is probably enjoying himself, which he should be. So hopefully he'll be back next week and get us right back in line with uh, the weather report. We do have some links that we always put in when Pat does the weather report. And so Eli is dropping those into the chat box at some point along in this hour. And by all means, feel free to save your chat. And we'll show you again how to do that if you're new and don't know how, we'll show that at the end of our, our session for today. The other thing that I'd like to let you know is that um, here is a map of Missouri and all the different folks that are horticulture working across the state. And we're all happy to answer your questions. You'll notice that there's a couple of positions that are still open. So we're in the process of hopefully filling those positions. We've got uh, a little bit of extra money that came our way for MU Extension. So hopefully we can get those filled soon. And if you're in a county and your person there, it says open, don't worry about that. Just email any one of us and we'll be more than happy to answer that question for you. Well, like I said, we enjoy uh, educating and providing our knowledge and helping you. And sometimes those questions come in and we don't always know the answer. So we have to research it ourselves. So we're also in the, in the form of learning ourselves and teaching ourselves a lot of questions and answers. And so we thank you for that because that's just as important. One of the things that I want to let you know is that someone did ask about, and that came in as one of our questions, if there is a conflict and I can't go to and watch your garden hour live on Zoom, how can I go back and watch that? And so what I want to do is just take a minute or so to let you guys know, if you just go out to your internet browser, just type in youtube.com. Once you get into the youtube.com, there should be a search engine there for you. And all you have to do is type in MUIPM, that stands for Missouri University Integrated Pest Management. And what that will do is bring up our homepage, which looks like this. Actually here, it, I'm sorry, it looks like this one over here. It have MU Extension Integrated Pest Management at the top. And then you'll scroll down and you'll see little snippets that we do each week. You'll see all of the full recordings that are there. And all you have to do is click on those recordings and it'd go live just as if you were listening to us live. Uh, so we're happy to share that. It was something we decided to do this year. And we have found that going back, we can see the total number of individuals who go back and rewatch our recordings if they weren't able to do it live. Or they're like, oh, what was that that they really said? And they'll go back. I know I've done it myself where I've gone into a snippet to find another answer again that I couldn't remember. So we're happy to share all of this with you. What I'd like to do now, since we don't have the weather report, is to go ahead and turn it over to Kelly. She's going to be our moderator today. The other folks that we have on is Eli is going to be uh, doing the chat box for us. Ask questions here is going to be done with uh, Justin, and he's happy to answer any questions if you can real quick there, or he'll interrupt us and ask your question if it pertains to what we're talking about, or even a new question. And then we also have Minoj on and I kind of call him our lawn turf guru because that's what he studied when he was in school and he has um, a, a question that he's going to answer for us today and of course we have Jared behind the scenes and he he's a pure gem and we always thank him for everything that he does with us so uh, Kelly I'm going to turn it over to you so let's go ahead and get started. 
Okay, thank you very much, Debbie. And while we go through our questions today, if you guys have questions or think of any questions about other topics that we haven't covered, go ahead and put those in the chat box and we will get to those as we can. So, so feel free to do that. Okay, so our first question today is about evergreens in the in someone's yard that are turning brown and they're not sure what to do. And I have been getting a lot of questions about this lately. So let's talk about it a little bit. Hang on just a second. Okay, so let's take a look at this here. Okay, so these are the pictures that were sent in from someone about the evergreens in her lawn. And let's take a look at some of these pictures here. Um, we're seeing some browning kind of throughout the plant. And then on these photos here, we're seeing a lot of random browning throughout the plant as well. So what could possibly be causing this? Well, whenever I get a question about landscape, evergreen, trees, or shrubs, I kind of have a mental list of things that I go through. Um, so, so let's talk about what some of those are. The first thing I want to show you here is look at this photo next to the brick wall. All right. So whenever we have a period of heat and drought, and right now we're all kind of, well, most of us anyway, especially in south, southern Missouri, we're suffering a lot of heat and a lot of drought. And whenever we get into the summertime, brick homes soak up a lot of sun's heat. They, they soak up a lot of heat. So any trees or shrubs or landscape plants that are right up next to that brick it's almost like they're next to an oven and we'll start to see some browning on that particular plant. And this is kind of a cumulative effect. You know, you may not see a whole lot the first or second growing season, but as that plant starts to get some, some age on it, you'll see it start to be more and more. And then we will get into a situation like we're seeing here. And another thing that you might notice on this is that we're missing a lot of branches and it's just overall not looking healthy. So being up next to the house, next to this brick, that excess heat could actually be frying this plant. It looks like most of the browning is on the side closest to the bricks. Um, there is a little bit on the other side, but for the most part, it is the worst on the side next to the brick. So in this particular case, I would say it could be just excess heat. And another thing, when you have shrubs up next to your house, they are often protected from the eaves and the overhang of the roof so that whenever we get rain, they don't get as much rain because they're being sheltered because of those eaves and overhang. So it could be that it's not getting enough water as well. So those are a couple of things that come to mind when I look at that particular that particular shrub right there. But some other things that we might consider on these other plants are this. So some common things that affect evergreen landscape shrubs is number one, spider mites. We, we do see a lot of spider mites on evergreens and spider mites like hot, dry conditions. So in the case of that shrub that's up next to the house, it's already being stressed because of the excess heat from the brick and not being able to get as much rainfall because of the overhangs of the roof. So whenever we have a plant that is under stress, it is more susceptible to disease and insect issues. And spider mites, not only do they like heat, heat and dry weather, but they also like plants that are under stress. So you can check your plants for spider mites by putting a white piece of paper underneath it and then just kind of gently shaking the plant and those guys will fall onto that sheet of paper and you'll be able to see them crawling around. You may also notice some webbing on that plant, kind of like a spider webbing. You might notice that throughout the plant as well, um, but they are a common 
insect pest of evergreen. So, so look for those. Now with these pictures, I didn't see any evidence of bagworms, at least not from what I could see, but bagworms are a very, very common insect pest of, ever, of evergreen landscape shrubs. So, you know, I know we've talked about bagworms in previous garden hours, but this is what they look like. They look like these little bags here and there'll be a little caterpillar inside of that eating on the juices of the plant and eventually it will start to you'll start to see some browning of the plant and it can just progress from there so so look for some of these bagworms another insect pest that we see on evergreens is scale and scale is going to look like little white specks on the foliage or the stems of the plant so see if you can see any of that as well Another issue that we see a lot on evergreen landscape shrubs is fungal diseases like tip blight and other things like that. And sometimes it's hard to tell. Sometimes we don't know if it's drought stress or if it's heat stress or if it's a fungal disease. Sometimes though with fungal diseases, you can look at the foliage of the plant and you'll see little spots that kind of look like black pepper, like table pepper. Um, so that can be an indication it might be a disease. But again, sometimes it's just, it's hard to tell. So in this case here, I am going to suspect that this may be heat and drought related. We are getting a lot of reports here in southwest Missouri of some of these evergreen shrubs that are starting to succumb to the heat and drought. So this could very likely be that. Um, it, it's hard to see. It's hard to know just by looking at these pictures, but it's probably heat or drought. And whoever submitted this particular question, you might look for some of these insect pests that I just mentioned. So let me stop sharing and I'm going to show you one more thing here. Let me turn on my camera. Okay. So this is one of my favorite tools that I use. And I don't know if you can see it well in my camera, but this is a hand lens. And these little hand lenses, they can be very inexpensive and you can just use them to look at the foliage of the plant. You can use them to look for scale insects or spider mite webbing or even those little black pepper spots on the foliage. So this can kind of get you in a good direction as well. If you're still not sure what might be going on, you're always welcome to send a, a sample into our plant diagnostic lab. Um, we can collect those samples for you at your local extension office and then send those on up to the lab on campus to make a further diagnosis. So those are just a few thoughts on those photos. So hopefully that helps and certainly reach out to one of us if you want to send off a sample. Okay, so our next question is about onions. And the question is, is that they grew onions for the first time this year. The, young, the onions are starting to be visible above the soil line. The question is, why is that happening? Will they get sunburned like potatoes will? Should they go ahead and harvest? Should they leave them? Just not sure what to do. Um, Justin, what do you think about this one? Yeah, thanks, Kelly. Um, just a second here. All right, so um, some great questions about growing onions and harvesting onions. I wanted to give just a brief uh, overview about onion culture. So if you haven't planted onions before, they're, they're generally planted in two ways. Um, as sets, which are the small bulbs that you see down on the bottom right, or um, you can also sometimes source plants, um, which look a lot like a green onion. And this is one of the earliest season veggies we can get out into the garden, uh, depending on where you're at in the state, you're looking somewhere between March 10th and March 15th. Um, one thing to note about onions is they are, they do prefer a kind of a narrow soil pH range. So 
Uh, if you want to grow onions and don't know your soil pH, uh, soil test is a great place to get that information and it'll give you recommendations to get your pH adjusted to a good level. Um, so you want to plant the sets about one to two inches deep. You want to make sure you give them a little bit of space so that the bulbs can bulb out and you can get some nice size onions for harvest. Um, they do prefer a little bit lower nitrogen fertilizer. So you can look for a fertilizer analysis like 51010 or something in a similar uh, ratio to that. Onions are very shallowly rooted. And so a mulch helps for two reasons. Mulch helps keeps the weed down, weeds down, as well as helps conserve soil moisture. Um, and it also prevents root damage from from cultivation. So um, if you if you don't have your onions mulch, but you need to cultivate them, just make sure you're cultivating them very shallowly um, for weed control because it's it's very easy to damage those um, tender roots that are, are very close to the soil surface. So when you're searching for onions, you know, next year and you're thinking about planting them, uh, look for onions that are labeled as long day varieties. Um, these are the ones that are going to work best in our climate and the hours of sun length we have. So um, these require 15 hours of sunlight for bulb formation. So during our long summer days, they can get the sunlight that they need to produce those. The short day varieties, um, you want to avoid those in our in our part of the country. Um, if the if you do have onions that end up flowering, um, make sure to remove those heads because it will impact the, the bulb growth and formation. Um, they're a, a long season crop, um, but you're generally looking at those maturing mid to late summer. Um, but in terms of this question about onions being above ground, so initially when you plant your set or your onion plants, you're going to notice a lot of vegetative growth. And then as the season progresses, you'll notice that those bulbs are going to expand and swell and they will naturally form at or near the soil surface. So um, that's that's not an issue at all. Um, that's the way they should be growing. And the question was related to, do I need to be concerned about greening? So that was referencing potatoes that maybe weren't hilled properly and were exposed to sun um, and potatoes will green up and they shouldn't be consumed. Um, green potatoes can be toxic, but for onions, this isn't, it isn't something to, be concerned about and you shouldn't you shouldn't hill your onions like uh, you hill your potatoes because they're really going to mature uh, best if they're on the soil surface exposed to the sun uh, like you see in the photograph uh, on the right. In terms of when you should harvest your onions um, a clear indicator is the picture on the right so um, the neck of that onion begins to fall over. If you're out of the garden for a couple of days, you might think your onions got hit by a windstorm, but that neck will fall over and the leaves will begin to dry. And this is when you want to initiate harvest of your, of your onions. Um, and after you harvest them, you need to think about where you're going to dry them. So they like to be in a warm location with really good air circulation. So this could be like under an awning, um, under the back porch, or it could be um, in the garage, for instance, a fan set on low can be a great way to dry these out. Just make sure you give them enough room because as they lose moisture, you don't want that moisture getting trapped between the onions that you're trying to dry out. When those tops are fully dry, um, you can go ahead and remove uh, most of that onion top and just leave about two to three inches uh, above, above the onion there. And then for storing them, you want to keep them in a in a somewhat cool, dry place. And when you're harvesting, if you have any that are damaged, go ahead and separate those. And you probably want to go ahead and eat those soon. If you have onions that are damaged and you store them with the rest of your undamaged onions, you could have issues um, in kind of spreading some rot to the other onions in storage. So just, just keep that in mind and kind of go through what you're harvesting and make sure to separate them whether they're damaged or undamaged and, and store those separately. So that's what I got on onions. All right, thank you. Okay, our next question is a pretty common problem that people have, and we're gonna talk a little bit about it today. What is the best way to maintain a gravel driveway and keep it free of weeds and grass? Manoj, what do you think about this one?
Okay, here we go. <clears throat> Let me do this full screen there. So yeah, so <clears throat> let's talk about managing weeds in hardscape. So whether it's be on your driveway, sidewalk, <clears throat> on your patio, this is pretty common uh, that we can see <clears throat> in our home. So what's the best way or strategy to manage these things? Um, Line. Okay, so let's first begin <laughs> what's happening uh, that's helping our weeds to pop up everywhere on our hard surface, right, on our pavements. So um, let's talk about this, then we will know how to best manage um, in controlling these weeds. Um, first of all, under the pavement and hard surface, <laughs> excuse me, under the pavement and hard surface, the, the soil there's some kind of soil and organic matter that is providing a best or perfect um, bedding materials for your wheat seeds so um, all those moistures that gets trapped underneath those pavements these are helping for your wheat seeds to germinate and and thrive and also weeds in general they are very hardy they provide they are prolific seed producers they, they, they produce a lot of seeds and once those seeds are produced, they travel miles and miles away. So um, in general, which they just thrive in any kinds of environment, um, but there's also good environment underneath their pavements that helping uh, those weeds to thrive. They are hardy, they, they can tolerate uh, all kinds of stress like high temperature stress, drought stress, uh, cold freezing temperatures, even the salt stress. So they are out competing uh, every other plants in general. Um, and therefore you can see those pesky weeds persistently in your uh, hard pavements. Now, what's the best way to tackle these? And there are quite a few options already. Uh, and some of you are already familiar and have been doing that, but many of you might not be getting as success um, as you wished. So one of the options is of course, the manual pulling out the weeds. And, and this is a most safest options because we don't use any kind of chemicals here, uh, but it requires a lot of labor work. And so not all of us have that kind of time and energy to do that. There are some specialized garden tools that does better than just a simple ordinary hose. Um, uh, you can shop around for that. Uh, but again, you have to be careful that some of the weeds are mostly uh, in general, the weeds, they have a deeper tap root system, which goes, um, about 10 to 12 inches deep. So you have to be careful about also removing the roots underneath. And if you only remove the above ground stems and uh, foliage, then you are not getting the permanent control from manual removal. Another option is pretty common. We can we see all uh, kinds of uh, these informations in YouTube and blogs. People, uh, they just keep, put those out and that, that they are very effective uh, non-chemical methods, but um, please uh, proceed with cautions for those things. Um, there are some options for uh, wheat, uh, controlling the weeds or, or killing the weeds with hot flames, uh, hot boiling water, a uh, high pressure steam. There are some kind of hot foams, uh, some device or tools that produce hot foams that can kill the weeds. Um, first of all, all these hot media, they, burn the foliage, just the above ground stems and foliage, stolons and things like that. They never reach or kill the roots. So over the time, those roots are going to regenerate and produce new growth. So these are not the permanent solutions. Uh, they are very effective. Like you can see the results within a day or two uh, as they are very <coughs> um, toxic to the plants. Um, but they are not a permanent solution, okay? And there's also always a high risk per bun. Uh, and you, you never realize what you're getting with a high pressure and a high temperature uh, medium. Another option for these um, weeds on your pavements will be natural chemicals. And these are also another category of uh, <laughs> management options, which we often see from amateur uh, lawn care guys and also some uh, homeowners. Uh, DIYers especially, uh, they tend they, they like the idea of using um, acidic acids and salts. Now the, the 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 meat in general here, I would say, is that these chemi these chemicals are uh, perceived as less toxic and less uh, harmful to the environment and to the human body. But um, maybe the actually the things are opposite. These are actually more harmful to your body and animals and, and, and and 
to the environment than uh, some of the uh, labeled herbicides. For example, the vinegar, which are um, pretty common and, and easy to get around, uh, and people like to use that, it has a very high acetic acid. And if you read the labels, especially in some of the horticulture vinegar that are available, that has more than 20% acetic acids. And that's actually more toxic and corrosive to your skin uh, than some of the labeled herbicides. Okay, so you always have to read the label, know what you are getting uh, and know what product you are using. So people generally, when, you, when they buy these common household products or horticulture vinegar uh, that has acetic acids, they tend to, they, they, they perceive these as a very safer options that they don't use some protective equipments or your gears that uh, the label has suggested them to use. And so they end up uh, causing more damage to their body when handling these um, supposedly uh, less harmful chemicals. So salts are also one of the options that people use uh, to kill weeds. But what happens with the salt is they're going to build up. So all the salts that you apply in your uh, pavement and driveway, they're going to end up in your lawns or in your flower beds with the rains and everything. So you are not doing too good to your environment by putting too much salt uh, to kill weeds. And the, one of the most guaranteed uh, and effective options is using labeled herbicides. So there are quite <coughs> options in using labeled herbicides. So one of the most common one is a non-selective herbicide. Uh, others are selective herbicides. So non-selective herbicide will kill everything, uh, all green plants. Um, selective will only kill, will kill a specific kind of weeds, uh, maybe perennials, maybe annuals, maybe grassy weeds, maybe uh, broadleaf weeds, sages, things like that. And these, these uh, level herbicides, they provide long-term control. They have, they have been proven from science and research that they control or they kill weeds and they have a minimal um, effect to your environment and to your soil in general. And they also have a, a proven method on how to best handle these products. Okay. So one of the products very common all around is glyphosate. So active ingredient is, ingredient is glyphosate, uh, trade name available as Roundup. Uh, when we say trade name Roundup, if you look up uh, and do some shopping for the Roundup, then you will find tons of products that's labeled and marketed as, a, as a Roundup. Uh, but in fact, they have a different purpose and they have different active ingredient in there. For example, here in the picture, I have just for an example, I have uh, picked this um, commercial product Roundup, which says it kills weeds, not the lawn. Remember glyphosate is, uh, is a non-selective herbicide. Okay. It kills everything, but this product says it does not kill lawns, it only kills weeds. That means this product does not have glyphosate. And when you buy this product to do uh, some weed control in your uh, uh, pavement and hard surface, then it will, it will not be as effective as uh, your glyphosate because this does not have glyphosate. It's marketed as Roundup, as a trend name, but it has other active ingredients like MCPP, Queen Chloric, uh, things like that, which were supposed to kill um, other broad leaves and grassy weeds. Okay, so just uh, when you buy a product, be sure what you are buying and what you are getting, looking at the uh, product label. So we want to buy glyphosate, not just a Roundup. The glyphosate is very effective in controlling uh, all kinds of weeds um, because it's a systemic product. So systemic means it moves down to the roots. When you apply in the top in the uh, plant canopy, it will the plant itself will take these herbicides down to the roots and then whole plants will get um, killed uh, by glyphosate. Okay. And it has also very minimal or few soil residual. Uh, when you spread this glyphosate, it, la it breaks down and then uh, it, the plants absorbs it and then the remaining glyphosates, it does not uh, become available for the leaching or uh, it does not just break down quickly. It's, at, it's, it's bound to your soil particles. So it has very minimal effect. It does not move around basically. It's, it's, it's very inexpensive product compared to other uh, herbicide options. And it's, it's very highly effective against all kinds of weeds, perennials, annuals, sages, broadleaf grass, all kinds of weeds, uh, it will work uh, very good. Another product in the market is glufosinate. It's active ingredient glufosinate uh, available in the market as Finale from Bayer. Uh, this is also another non-selective herbicide, meaning it kills everything it touches, uh, but it's, it's locally systemic. So when I say locally systemic, 
if you spread these on the foliage, it will just move within the within the leaf. It will not uh, transfer transport down to the root. So only your um, only your parts of the weeds that's got spread on will be killed. Uh, so it does not have a lot of movement. And that's helpful when you have a concern for your nearby flower beds and plants. Uh, you don't want to have a lot of drifting and a lot of side effect uh, moving that uh, product nearby. Then this will be a good option because it does not, it does not move as, uh, as much as glyphosate. It's very effective for her annuals and sedges. For the perennials, it's not as effective as glyphosate uh, because it doesn't. It's not totally systemic. But uh, with uh, repeated applications and with uniform coverage, you can also get good control on perennial weeds. Now, once you spray these products, um, any products you do, you, you just cannot sit there and hope to have everything good. Actually, the, remember in the first slide, I said these weeds are growing in your crags, <laughs> in your hard pavement, because there is some good environment. There's a soil, there's organic matter, there is a moisture. Uh, so you have to take care of those. Once you kill, uh, once you spray herbicides, um, depending on the, what kind of herbicide you spray, the glyphosate will take at least um, seven to 10 days for your weeds to kill. So wait for several days once uh, your weeds are dead, you can remove the weeds and you have to remove, you have to spend some time removing all the soil and organic matter from the cracks. If you are very uh, fastidious about, you know, keeping your driveway or hard surface clean, then you have to fill that empty void surface uh, with uh, some kind of filling materials. And then only you can avoid that perennial problems. Otherwise, once you kill the weeds, it will come back again. The weed seeds will travel, find place to land on those tiny cracks and they will again germinate. Okay, now that will be uh, for the how to manage your weeds in your hardscape. Now, since I have a little bit of time here, I want to spend some time uh, focusing on your fall uh, renovations on your lawn. And these things we have seen, um, these questions is coming all the time that my yard is um, covered with all kinds of weeds and how do I renovate? So here's an example of a lawn that's heavily infested with Creeping Charlie or ground ivy. So for these types of infestation of weeds, you know, there is a no way you can bring back those turf uh, by killing those weeds. So it's, a, it's wise and more prudent to actually kill everything there in your yard using glyphosate. So you broadcast the glyphosate with the uniform coverage, kill everything there, and then restart. So remember the fall is your time when you can work on your yard very, very efficiently. So this is the time where you can aerate your soil, or aerate your lawn um, for good aerations, for, uh, for managing your thatch, for improving your soil um, aerations, and, and then reseeding and starting uh, with some good starting fertilizers and things like that. So this is the time um, if you are struggling with those kinds of yard, then you can go ahead and do glyphosate applications, kill all those green uh, things that you have in your yard, including your turf grass, and then restart with uh, core aerations, fertilizers, and seeds. Okay. Similarly, with the if you if you have a lawn, you have been struggling with um, Bermuda grass infestations in your tall fescue or in your Kentucky bluegrass, uh, or even your some zoysia grass infestations. Then maybe in some of the cases where you have a heavy infestations, it's wise to use glyphosates to control those Bermuda grass or zoysia grass, rather than using selective products like. Um, you have some of the selective products that can kill only Bermuda grass, but they're very expensive and uh, you don't get as effective control as with glyphosate because, um, uh, you know, th these are the products only selectively killing Bermuda grass and not tall fescue. So, this, so they have a uh, less effectiveness compared to glyphosate in terms of killing uh, Bermuda grass or Georgia grass. Um, and one another important thing of using or advantage of using glyphosate is once you spray uh, the glyphosate, then you can immediately reseed or put down your seeds. There is no waiting time, unlike some of the post emergent herbicides or pre emergent herbicides. When you use them, you have to wait at least four weeks, or even some cases of pre emergent, you have to use wait until eight weeks. So for this glyphosate, you can immediately put down your seeds. Uh, it does not affect your seed germination. So uh, this is the uh, way I would suggest to renovate your lawn if you are suffering from these kind of problems. Uh, that'll be all from my side. Thank you. Hey, Manoj, while we got you on the line, um, I noticed that we had a question about 
Lespedeza uh, mm -hmm. in a lawn and the question said, ouch, my lawn is filled with Lespedeza, what, what can I do? Okay, so the common Lespedeza is uh, one kind of uh, a weed, a broadleaf weed. It, it has a three leaves uh, attached uh, like a clover. Uh, there's a very uh, prominent veins on that. So I suppose the client has identified positively for the common Lespedeza. Um, it can be confusing, it looks like a clover. Uh, so this is a creeping uh, weed. So it, it spreads uh, through runners and it quickly takes over the lawn. Yes. Uh, so for this control, I would suggest uh, some cultural options, raising mowing heights to at least three inches if you have cool season. Uh, I don't know if the client has cool season or warm season lawns, but uh, just raise your mowing heights. Uh, watch for, for these um, good drainage and maintaining your good soil aerations. Uh, if you have very highly compacted soils in, highly tra in high traffic areas, then uh, this kind of Weeds can be perennial problems, so uh, take your time to uh, address these issues using core aerations, um, improving your drainage, um, releasing your food traffic and things like that. And then some of the herbicide options to manage these weeds is you can spray pre-emergent in the springtime, uh, like you spread for the crabgrass preventer, uh, the pre-emergent. The, the thing that you spread for uh, that you use for crabgrass preventer will work for common lispidia as well. Uh, the Dethiopia is the product uh, available as Dimension, or you can also use a product uh, gallery as a pre emergent herbicide. Um, so anything that controls or prevents crabgrass will also prevent um, the germinations of lispidia. For the post emergent herbicides, um, this will. This is not a very hard weed to control with uh, herbicides. So you have quite options there for the homeowners. Dicamba will be the one, and the easy one or um, the common one. 2,4-D will also work. Um, and you have a triclopier, which is a little bit premium product uh, that has a combination of other uh, two active ingredients. So triclopier, dicamba, 2,4-D, these will be the products that you can spray on to control um, your lispigia. Thank you. Awesome, thanks, Manoj. All right, thank you, Manoj. Uh, just a follow-up question, Manoj. We had come in the chat. Um, so you were mentioning some more kind of organic options, such uh, as horticulture vinegar, the acetic acid, salt, things like that. And you were mentioning that those can be used on like a gravel driveway. But what about using those in the lawn? So those will kill everything. Uh, those are non-selective options. Um, so those will be the only ones when you want to control, when you want to use them uh, in your in your hard payment. So if you use them on your lawn, it will also kill your uh, turf grass. Okay, very good to know. Thank you very much. Thank you. And yeah, we had a, a comment in the in the chat box about you know glyphosate. Um, the potential to cause cancer and things like that. And I understand, um, you know, I'm not a big fan of using chemicals myself. We get so many questions in the extension office from people that use Roundup on a regular basis. And, you know, we just try to educate people about the facts and then leave it up to them whether they want to use that product or not. And we also like to talk about organic options. And so there, there are some of those as well. So I understand and um, definitely understand that comment. So, okay. Uh, next question is, oh, this one's a pretty cool one. So the question is about Hubbard squash. Uh, the question is about trench treatment for Hubbard squash. Should the pesticide be applied in the soil surrounding the seed? Um, and use as a trap crop. So Justin, what do you have for us on that? Yeah, thanks, Kelly. So we, uh, we if, if folks are wondering what we're talking about, we covered trap cropping uh, last week. So I encourage you to go ahead and check out the recording. Um, and it, it looks like Eli dropped that in the chat box. So uh, Blue Hubbards are capable of drawing in uh, a lot of the pests, common pests of cucurbit crops, and so they can be planted as a trap crop to keep those pests away from the plants that you're trying to grow, such as summer squash uh, or zucchini. So the question was related to using a drench insecticide on the blue hubbard. So that's related to the use of a systemic insecticide 
um, where the insecticide is incorporated into the plant tissues and then offers a fair amount of time of uh, control for insects that that land and try to consume that plant. So when you plant a trap crop, you need to maintain that trap crop and make sure that it's not getting overcome by pest pressure or it'll stop doing its job. So in the talk last week, I mentioned folks using systemic insecticide potentially on a trap crop. And so the question that came in was related to how, how do you apply that? So you wouldn't apply that on the seed. You would actually apply that um, when the crop is transplanted because the roots are going to need to be able to take that up into its tissue. And so it can be applied in a drench at the base of the plant. Make sure you're reading the label. Um, there are sometimes some harvest restrictions if you actually plan to eat that blue Hubbard. Um, so you would need to, for instance, wait 21 days after application of that insecticide to eat the Blue Hubbard. But make sure you read, read the label. We also recommended last week, if you were going to use this option to control pests on the trap crop, to go ahead and remove the blooms. And so if you remove the blooms, we can take away the risk that pollinators might be potentially landing on those um, trap crop flowers that were treated with uh, systemic insecticide. So, so that's a great question. Okay, thank you. Okay, so another thing that we have been getting questions about, and I know there's been a lot of activity here at the Springfield Botanical Gardens doing this very thing, and that is dividing iris. And Debbie is gonna tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I'm happy to do so. Um, Dr. Trinkline actually put out a, a little notice about transplanting iris. And so I more or less pulled his information and pulled some beautiful pictures of irises. Um, irises are, are really great uh, plant to have in our flower beds. Uh, they come in multiple colors. They're really bright and pretty. Um, you may not be able to find a lot of different irises at the store in the spring to plant. Um, a lot of folks, what they'll do because they're so easy to grow and transplant is to just, when it comes time to dividing them out and tra retransplanting them, um, people share them. And that's how I've got my irises. I didn't buy any. I've been able to get them from other folks that are like, hey, I have to divide my plants. Can I do that? Um, so what I thought I'd do is just talk about some of these different um, topics that are we have to remember when we talk about it. Um, and I think I have my slides backwards. Okay. So this slide here um, actually should have been the first one after the introduction, so I apologize for that. So when we're planting our, um, maybe I have it all wrong. Oh, maybe I accidentally deleted that one slide. Oh, here it is. Okay, so can I start over again? Beautiful flowers in the garden to have irises. So you can see multiple colors that are here. Um, irises are easy to grow. They do need eight hours of direct sunlight. So if you've got them in a location where my irises are, the shade is starting to creep in, I'm going to have to move them if I want to make sure that they still grow and produce beautiful blooms and colors. They do need that direct sunlight. They actually can be transplanted at about any time after the blooms fade. However, it's best to do that between mid-August to October because we really wanna make sure that we get those um, blades of of their leaves, the blades to get as much sun as they can get for photosynthesizing to produce energy, to push it back down into the roots of the plant for the growth for next year. So that's one reason why you probably want to wait a little bit longer into late summer and to early fall. And I don't know about you, but this is one of my favorite ones here. I love that coloration. So the best way to do that is to actually dig up the the, the clump or a grouping of them and try to shake off as much of the soil as you can so that you can see where the roots are actually exposed. exposed. And then you're going to see the rhizome. The rhizome is actually an underground modified stem. And so we don't think of it as a modified stem. So we call it a rhizome. And a lot of folks think that it's actually a root when in reality, these all here are going to be the roots. This over here as you can see, these pieces 
are actually the rhizome. So what you wanna do is you can take a scissors or a real sharp knife and cut the rhizomes, but you need to make sure that you keep what they call a fan. And a fan is going to be these blades here the leaves of the iris itself. And so generally what will happen is you can divide them between, so you can see three or four different ones here that each have its own fan. And then notice also what they do is they cut these fans where they cut them down, those blades down. So there's still some growth on there, but the reason for cutting that is that they're probably gonna need a lot of moisture to continue to have that growth of the green. And if you cut that off, they may not require as many nutrients and as much water for that. So the transplanting uh, that needs to take place for that plant focuses on the transplanting instead of continuing to grow those blades or that fan the leaves. Some other things to think about is that they are a shallow planted type of a crop. So we wanna make sure that we expose the top of the rhizome to at least about a third of that rhizome itself in the soil. So you see some of it in the soil and some of it above the soil. And um, it's important for the spacing to be about 12 to 24 inches apart because it grows really nice and it spreads really nice. You wanna make sure that you water it immediately after you plant it because just like any kind of a transplant, we always want to make sure we water it in, and that's the same when we're dividing our irises. Now, if you want something that's going to have color really quickly, instead of taking its time to fill out at the 12 to 24 inches apart, you can take those rhizomes and plant them closer together, but it just means you're going to have to divide them sooner rather than later because they're going to really fill out a whole lot. And that's what I have on the irises and hopefully you'll have some good pretty ones and hopefully some neighbors might have some that they're dividing and you can add the color to your garden. Thanks, Debbie. I love iris. I love, they always remind me of my, my grandmothers. So one of my favorites. Okay, well, um, let's talk a little bit more about some drought issues. Um, here in Southern Missouri, again, we have just had an awful drought and heat, and it is really taking a toll on our trees. So let's talk a little bit about drought stress in trees. Okay, so as I've been out and about around Springfield the last few days, I've noticed that some trees are starting to change color. They're starting to get their fall coloration. And whenever we see a tree that is prematurely getting its fall color, that is likely a sign of stress. And of course, we have had stress here with no rain and excessive heat. I've seen this a lot in these parking lot islands where there are trees growing and they're just really struggling right now. And that's where I've seen the most of this uh, tree leaf color change. So let's talk a little bit about why that happens. Um, most of the tree's active roots are going to be within the top few inches of the soil. Now a lot of people think that trees put down one big long tap root and maybe a few other roots, but, but most trees are going to have a root system like this. Most of the roots are going to be within the top few inches and can extend well beyond that drip line. So whenever we get into a period of drought like we've had, you know, the, the top few inches of soil can be very dry and hard as a rock. And so that can be very hard on those fragile fine roots that that tree needs to take up water and nutrients. So not, not only is it um, baking the soil, but it's also baking the root system as well. So stressed trees are more susceptible to disease and insect issues. And we are starting to see that a little bit with some species of trees. You know, they, we've been in a period of drought for several weeks now. The trees' immune system is weakened. So we might see things like trees succumb to Dutch elm disease, um, oak wilt, things like that. 
And so, and then this goes for any kind of plant, any kind of a stressed plant is going to be more susceptible to disease and insect issues. That's just kind of a fact of it. So some symptoms of drought stress, and we're certainly seeing a lot of this, is just dead leaves falling from the tree. You know, whenever a tree has a full set of leaves, you know, it's, it's taking water and nutrients to keep those leaves alive. So this is a drought response in trees. They're trying to drop some of these excess leaves to conserve water. And so we'll see this, you know, leaf drop underneath the trees. We'll also see leaf scorch. And you can see a photo of that here. Very common problem. And then again, you might see some premature fall coloration. So what can you do? Well, the main thing you can do is a slow, deep watering about every five to seven days. Now this is for um, your mature trees. So slow, deep watering every five to seven days during drought conditions. If the temperature is above 95 degrees, which we have had a lot of, maybe every four to six days would be best. If it is a young tree, maybe newly planted to two to three years old, um, a good watering every two to three days is recommended. Put a sprinkler beneath the tree canopy and use some type of a measuring device and stop watering when you measure two inches in that rain collection device. And make sure to water the entire root zone of the tree and morning watering is best. So other than a sprinkler, sprinkler or just hand watering, there are things you can buy to kind of slowly per percolate water into the soil. We have these kind of tree bags that can be purchased. You just fill them up and they slowly leach that water. Or you can make something yourself with just small holes drilled in a bucket. If there's grass underneath the tree, if it's a tree that's in your lawn, be aware that more water is going to be needed. That turf grass will absorb a lot of that water and take it away from the tree. So you might consider replacing the grass at the base of the tree with mulch at a depth of about two inches. Um, and do keep in mind the correct way to mulch a tree. You don't want to pile it up around the base. You want the tree to be visible at the base. You want more of a donate, a donut shape than a volcano shape. So that's very important as well. Uh, do not prune or fertilize trees that are under stress. I've had a lot of calls from people wanting to spray some kind of fertilizer on their trees, and you never want to fertilize trees that are under stress. That can further stress them, and um, that's definitely not what we want right now. Don't transplant young trees during drought conditions, and consider native trees. You know, native trees, native trees to Missouri are better able to adapt to extreme weather changes like we're seeing right now. So if you're needing to replace a tree in your yard, consider some native options. There's a lot of beautiful ones to choose from. And be mindful that drought stress sometimes doesn't show up for a few years in large mature trees. We saw this several years ago when we had a couple of summers of really bad drought and trees didn't start to, trees didn't start to show symptoms until a couple of years later. So your trees may look fine now, but a couple of years down the road, you may start to see some issues. And then basically just give your trees the love and attention that you give your vegetables and flowers. You know, we're out there watering and tending them, but we also want to give some attention to our trees as well. So that's all we have on that. And I think I think we probably have time for one more thing. So Debbie, uh, do you have some horticulture terminology for us? Yeah, I do. So um, today what's going to be is the term droop. So if you want to put into uh, the poll, Jared, if you don't mind pulling that up for me, great, thank you. So the question is, is droop, does that mean another term to describe the wilting of a plant, a flesh, fleshy fruit with one seed, 
a bud that bends downward and then the flower opens. Great, I'm seeing some answers coming in. Kind of going from one to another. I'll give you another couple of seconds here. All righty, so I'll end the poll and I'll share the results so that you can see. There's about 35% say it's A, 39% say B, and 26% say C. So I'm going to stop sharing and close that up. And the actual answer is a droop means a fleshy fruit with one seed. So examples of that would be peaches, nectarines, cherries. Those are, are some Bing cherries that I had in my refrigerator. I pulled them out, took a picture. Um, mango, which is on the right, that's one of my most favorite fruits. If you ever can get one fresh off of a tree when you're in some of the countries that can grow it, trust me, you wanna take one fresh off the tree. They're fabulous. So these actually have one seed in the middle and they're fleshy around it. And that's what a droop is called. We can also have some of our nuts actually are considered a droop as well. And that even though it's not fleshy, it's still considered a droop because there's one seed on the inside of that hardness. But really we think of droop as around a fleshy fruit. But we also have the term called drooplet. And so droplets is an aggregate of a whole bunch of droops. So examples, the easy ones to think of is raspberry and blackberry. So if you look at the blackberry and raspberry, you see, we think this in, as one fruit, but really the whole fruit is called a droplet that has all these individual droops as part of an aggregate off of one stem. And those are called droplets. So hopefully you've learned something today with that. And then Kelly, is it okay if I just go on to the next piece? Yeah, go ahead and go on and then you can close this out as well. Okay, great. So I'm calling up the other um, slides here. We've got a bunch of things that are coming up that we wanted to make sure you all were aware of. On August 27th, if you're in the central Missouri area at what is called the Jefferson Farm, which is one of our research farms that are close to campus, they're just on the outskirts of Columbia, they're having the Home Garden Showcase. They're doing tastings. Um, I like this one here. It says, enter your weed, so bring a breed that you've got into the tallest weed contest to win a prize. I've never heard of that kind of a contest. I thought that was awfully interesting. They'll have folks there to help you identify the weed. So if it's not the tallest and you wanna know what weed you've got, bring it. Um, there will be some little things there, little 15 minute types of presentations on um, growing some different types of crops, soil samples. Um, there's going to be lots of activities for your kids. So it's a family event. There is a charge of $5 and it's um, in Columbia. And on the screen right now is the website where you can register. And then Eli's gonna drop that into the chat box. Then I've got upcoming for those of you who are not tired of gardening with the heat, and the humidity and are interested in a fall garden. Uh, Donna, Katie and I are doing the fall vegetable gardening webinar. It starts on August 18th, there will be four sessions. So we'll do, talk about lasagna gardening, soils and cover crops, season extension, and then tool maintenance and garden cleanup. And so we'll drop in the chat box, the link so that you can go ahead and register for, register for that. This is gonna be via Zoom. And it'd be from 6.30 to 8. If you're not able to make the, the sessions live, that's okay. We'll be recording them and sending out the recordings so you can watch it at a later time. Another thing that's coming up is the Master Gardener Conference. So the conference is not just for Master Gardeners. It's for everyone that's interested in gardening. So it is an open event. It's going to take place in Jefferson City. It travels around the state every year in September. So this year it'll be in Jefferson City on Friday and through Sunday, September 16th through September 18th. MOMGA, the Missouri 
Master Gardener Association. So all the Master Gardener chapters are a member and they're the ones that actually are putting on the conference this year. And if you're interested, I just took a snippet from their webpage at momga.org. Um, the complete registration so you can see the agenda. There's going to be half day tours. There's going to be full day tours, breakout sessions, dinners and some meals are included. There's going to be advanced training for those of you that are master gardener and are interested in those types of educational hours. Lots of great things. Plus, a lot of us that you hear talk on this uh, uh, forum for the math for the garden hour. Uh, a lot of us will be doing some presentations as well. So we'll get to meet you face to face. So we'd love for that to happen. Then there's one last event. Uh, we do, some of you live in a more rural community and don't have the opportunity to attend a face-to-face -face Master Gardener course. And so uh, Dave Trinkline is leading up an online Master Gardener training. It's a self-paced uh, class that you do yourself. Each week, a new session will open up and you just go through it on your own. And the registration is there. We realize that $200 can be quite expensive for some individuals, and so there could be some scholarships available. And if that's the case, then just reach out to one of us, and then we'll try to get you connected with what that scholarship is and how you might be able to do that. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing for that and open up my other PowerPoint to get us closed out for the day. So bear with me as I switch gears in my computer here, guys. All righty, so we, there's a lot of great information that we dropped down into the chat box, good conversations. You can save that uh, chat box information to your own computer. When the chat box is open, if you go down to the bottom where it says to everyone, and then they have, a, a to me, it looks like a piece of paper, a smiley face and three dots. Click on that three dots and another little window will open and it will say save chat. And so then it will go probably somewhere onto your uh, laptop or your, your device. And then you can go find that so you can download all of those, uh, read through all of those chats and click onto some of those links that are there. We also, again, I talked earlier about how to watch us on the live stream or they're being recorded. So you can always go back and watch us at the YouTube channel, MUIPM. And then we have our upcoming, we're meeting again every Wednesday. We're very happy to answer your questions. And if you have a question, go back out where you originally registered, even though it says town halls, click on the one that says the garden hour and post your question there and submit it in. We can take your pictures too. We'd love to see your pictures because it can help us to identify what might the issue might be or offer some suggestions or whatever it might take. And then I'll just leave this slide up for just another minute or so. Um, and we'll kind of end here. If you need to reach out to any of us, there's our emails and we're happy to answer those questions for you. Thank you for joining us.